morning's message is going to be called The Christian Mind Part 2. And I would ask the congregation to please stand as we first pray and then read the Word of God. Please turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Let us pray. And now we humble ourselves before God Almighty, whose grace has gifted us and whose love has saved us. Patiently now we wait for thee. Your word is a lamp to our paths and a light to our feet. May the Holy Spirit strengthen his servant to deliver a word of truth so that many to Jesus will come and meet. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, the NASB says, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Please be seated. Church, there's going to be one core idea that this sermon is going to relay. And it's going to communicate the biblical truth of an idea called sanctification. That's a fancy word. What does that mean? Sanctification means making holy. If you are a vessel, sanctification means removing what is dishonorable out of the vessel and putting in what is pure, what is clean, what is honorable into the vessel. Sanctification means moving away from something and moving to something. In the biblical case, sanctification means moving away from secular things and moving toward Christ. Sanctification is also a process. It's not an event. It's a step-by-step, day-by-day pattern. So your Christian life is a process of sanctification. Now, why is sanctification important? Because when you are saved, when you profess faith in Jesus Christ and you say, yes, Jesus Christ is my King and He is my Lord, you are now in a relationship And that relationship is not one-sided. So when you profess faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, and he promises to forgive you of all of your sins, you now promise to obey him. And as Jesus says in John 17, 17, sanctify them in your truth, your word is truth. And as 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification provides stability in the Christian life. It provides discipline in the Christian life. And it it gives you the ability, gives you the power to be a better and better imitator of Jesus Christ. And God sanctifies us by the renewing of our minds. This is why this is the second series in the series titled The Christian Mind. Because God sanctifies us by the renewing of our minds. For as a man thinks within himself, so he is. So today I'm I'm going to describe seven steps to the renewing of your mind, the means of sanctification. So let's now swing back to our theme verse, Romans chapter 12, verse 2. In Romans chapters 1 through 11, 
the Apostle Paul, the writer of Romans, gives us a broad sweep of Christian truth. He gives us a broad sweep of the gospel. He talks about the fall of humankind. He talks about redemption in Christ. He talks about God being sovereign in salvation. And then in chapter 12, Paul gets into practical applications. And he begins chapter 12 by basically saying, if you've gotten, if you believe everything I've just said in chapters 1 through 11, then this is how you will live. And he begins by saying, the life of the believer is characterized by transformation. And that transformation happens by the renewing of your mind. Our minds are important to God, for as it says in Psalm 7-9, for the righteous God tries the hearts and the minds. The Christian mind must be fully engaged to love God. For as Jesus says in Matthew 22, 37, the greatest commandment from the start of the Bible to the end is this simple commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. A fully operational, well-informed mind is necessary to serve Jesus Christ. As Paul writes in Romans 7.25, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. So in our theme verse, Romans 12.2, the Apostle Paul is telling us something. He's telling us that in our lives, our minds are going to be formed by something. They're, it's like worship. Every human being on the face of planet Earth, their heart worships something. Paul is saying every human being on the face of planet Earth, their mind is going to be formed by something. Either your mind is conformed or your mind is transformed. Conformity means something from the outside works from the outside on your mind. Conformity comes from a Greek word that means to mold or to shape. Conformity means there's an invisible hand out there in the world that reaches in between your ears and molds the clay of your mind to fit you into specific cast or into a mold. That's conformity. It's passive. You sit back and allow yourself to be conformed. Transformation is active. Transformation is change that begins on the inside and then manifests outward. That's a change that begins within. That's an internal influence persuading you to be transformed. And Paul is contrasting these two. He's calling us from conformity to transformation. So let's read our theme verse again. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So Paul says, do not be conformed to this world. And as I said, conformed comes from a Greek, wo Greek root, meaning to be molded or shaped like a piece of clay. When he says, do not be conformed to this world, world does not refer to the physical geographical world, like China and South America. World comes from a Greek word, aeon, which refers to the age, as in the dominant cultural values, as in the spirit of the age. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4, Paul uses the same word and says the present world, the present age, is dominated by the devil and his God-despising values. So when Paul says, do not be conformed to this world, he's saying, 
don't allow yourself to be molded by the spirit of the age. Which brings us to our first step. Seven steps to renewing your mind. Step number one. Be saved. The world wants nothing to do with God. And you cannot be, you cannot stop being conformed to this world if you are of this world. So you have to examine yourself and in your heart of hearts ask yourself, do you believe that Jesus Christ, being the Son of God, came into this world and he died so that you could live? Do you embrace the fact that humanity is fallen and we all suffer from the spiritual disease of sin? And there is only one treating physician that has the prescription that can cure you. That is Jesus Christ. Do you believe that he lived? Do you believe that he died on a real cross that is so real you could get a splinter on that cross? And do you believe that God raised his son from the dead three days later? Do you profess faith? in Jesus Christ as King and as Lord. If you do and you are saved, then amen, brother. Amen, amen sister. Amen, amen church. Amen. But if you don't believe that, then you must examine yourself and call upon the name of the Lord because your mind can never yield to God if your spirit hasn't first. The mind follows the spirit, not the other way around. So step number one, be saved. Step number two, change your mind about sin and repent. Step number two, change your mind about sin and repent. This is what I'm not about to say. This is not going to be another preacher telling people you're sinners, you're disgusting, shape up your act. That's overdone. I'm going to explain to you how. So step number two, change your mind about sin and repent. So what is sin? Sin is anything that falls outside of God's will. Sin that is living a life independent of God as God. Sin is doing things that are bad. Sin is doing things that are immoral. Sin is anything that likes to live in the darkness. So when you change your mind about sin and repent, you have to change your mind about how powerful sin really is. You cannot underestimate the gravity of sin. Its beachhead of power is our flesh, is our physical, biological, natural bodies. You can't underestimate its power, its pervasiveness, or its persistence. Sin warps your spirituality. Sin warps your will. Sin warps your imagination. Sin even warps the thing that you do in service to God. That's how powerful it is. It can warp the things you do in the name of Jesus Christ. You have to have a healthy dose of respect of what sin can do. Because if you underestimate it, that's exactly what it wants you to do. Because sin is irrational. It's destructive. And it will not stop until it takes you out. So we have to start beginning distrusting ourselves. We have to start distrusting what we think or feel on the inside because that's warped by sin. You have to change your mind that repentance is about feelings. You are not going to be saved on Monday and say, I love Jesus, then wake up on Tuesday and not feel like sinning anymore. That is a hocus pocus fairy tale. Repentance is not about feeling a certain way. Repentance is about a change of mind 
not a change of heart. The Greek word for repentance in the New Testament, metanoia, doesn't mean to feel a certain way about something. It means to change one's mind. It doesn't matter if you are someone who looks at pornography and that leads to masturbation, who looks at pornography and that leads to adultery, who's deceitful, who's lustful, who lies all the time. It doesn't matter. You are never going to wake up one day and say, I don't feel like doing this anymore. That's never, ever going to happen. How change begins is you have to change your mind. You have to make the decision in your head because as a person thinks within themselves, so they are. So you decide first in your mind, this is something that is wrong. This is something which will ultimately lead me to destruction. And once you change your mind about it, now your behavior will follow. Because as Jesus says in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, unless you change your mind, you will all likewise perish. You have to change your mind about who you are. When you profess faith in Jesus Christ, you now lose the right to do as you please. You are a bondservant bought with a price, which means you don't have the right to wake up one day and say, I'm going to do what I want to do because you are no longer yours. You are a bondservant of the Most High. You are not free to do as you please. You must. You absolutely have to change your mind about who you are. You are not a free agent. You are a child of God. So when you talk about habitual sin, when you talk about moving away from old carnal lifestyles, you have to look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself, does the cross mean anything to you? Because you tell me, if you stand there at the foot of the cross and see your Lord and Savior crucified and tortured for your sin, for my sin, you tell me if you can look at him and look at your sin, shrug your shoulders to Christ and say, I choose sin. It can't happen because it doesn't make any sense. You have to change your mind about who you are. You are a child of God bought with a price, not a free agent. You have to change your mind about what to do about sin. We have this thing in the medical world that's called primary prevention, which means you do things that keep you healthy, therefore you never get sick in the first place. So for example, you eat a good diet, you get exercise, blah, 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 you never get diabetes and hypertension, you never take medication, it lowers healthcare costs, you get the picture. Primary prevention always works the best. So when you change your mind about what to do about sin, you have to realize something. S realize something. Sin is born in your mind. The battle of sin is won not in behavior. It is fought and won in your mind. The way you end habitual sin isn't by focusing on what you do. It's by focusing on what you think. And that is how change is affected. James tells us how sin is born in James 1, 14 and 15. He says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Sin is born, it is given breast milk, it is given a place to sleep in a cradle in the mind. And then when it grows up, the manifestation, the effect of that is you committing a sin. In order to conquer habitual sin, 
you have to change your mind about what to do about it and not win the battle on the outside. You have to win the battle in your imagination and stop the sin before you think it. Resist sin at the point of conception because sin is a lie that promises pleasure and all sin is incubated in the mind. Therefore, you must, be, you must gain mastery of your thoughts if you want victory over sinful habits. Start thinking about what it is you're thinking about. Now, there's someone out there asking a question. They're saying, Pastor, that's all fine and dandy, but sin is pleasurable. Sin feels good. And I would even add, if you do sin right, sin feels great. That's reality. And you think that you're going to be missing out on something by now denying yourself pleasure. But let me tell you something. Sin is merely a forgery of God-given joy. So when you deny yourself pleasure, you're not losing anything. You're going to gain joy. Let's break this down. Pleasure is a function of the body. It's biological, right? So if you have a nice piece of pie with ice cream, you have biological changes in your mind that say, mmm, that tastes great, and, you, and it's pleasurable. That lasts for 30 seconds, and then the pleasure goes away. That's biological. Then there's happiness. Happiness is psychological in the mind. Happiness says something like, I just saw my grandchild born. I just won a million dollars. Now you're happy. It's something reacting to the environment that goes on in your mind. Happiness lasts longer than pleasure, but it still fades away with time. But what is joy? Joy is a God-given gift by the Holy Spirit, which is independent of circumstances, which means you could be in jail and have joy. You could be in the midst of adversity and have joy. You could be spat on but have joy. So here's my question. Why would you ever settle for pleasure when you could have joy? Pleasure is a third-rate forgery of God given joy. And losing out on pleasure doesn't mean you lose out on pleasure. It means you gain something far better, the gift of the Holy Spirit, joy. Change your mind about how to deal with sin. Let's ask everybody a question. Have you ever wondered why you have this habitual sin and you keep on doing it? Why you say, Lord, forgive me, I repent, and the very next day you do the same thing because you haven't read James 5, 6. What does James 5, 6 say? It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another. Let me say this again. James 5, 6 says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. See, when you confess and repent, the blood of Jesus Christ, he promises to forgive you. But the difference between someone repenting and then doing it over again and someone who is healed is if they confess to someone else and have a prayer confessional partner. And when you verbalize that sin and confess to someone else what you have done, that is the biblical blueprint for being healed. So you are not only not forgiven, you are not only not only forgiven, but you are now healed and no longer fall back into the habitual sin. And husbands, wives, here's a quick little note. If you are married, you have now have a God-given confessional prayer partner for life. Step number three. Do not feed your mind garbage. Step number three. Do not feed your mind garbage. Why would you not want to feed your mind garbage? Because if garbage goes in, garbage comes out. 
Your mind is the most precious natural gift that God gave you. But your mind doesn't have an excretory function. It has a hard time getting rid of stuff. Let me break that down what that means. Our bodies have an excretory function, right? If there's toxins or junk inside, we can perspirate, we can urinate or defecate. What does that mean? We can sweat it out, we can pee it out, or we can poop it out. That's how our bodies were designed. It can get rid of bad stuff on the inside. If you go to a food truck and have a funky hot dog, your body will begin vomiting and having diarrhea. Why? It's excreting or getting rid of the bad stuff. So the vomiting and diarrhea is actually helpful. In a sense, our spirits have an excretory function. Because you commit a sin, now you have a stained spirit. What does the blood of Jesus Christ now do? It washes you clean. So what was once as scarlet is now as white as snow. But your minds don't have an excretory function. That's why you have memories. Because you can't unremember a memory. That's why traumatic events in the past are so traumatic. Because your mind can't get rid of them. Your mind doesn't have an excretory function. What's the point? The point is this. What you put into your mind has a hard time getting out because garbage in, garbage out. So when Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, we have to be very careful the things that we watch, the things that we see, the things that we listen to, the things that we read, because all of those are inputs into our mind. And I want you to imagine figuratively the world, the spirit of the age, there's an invisible hand where it almost reaches out. And when you're passively being conformed, it molds and shapes your brain based upon all these things that are being input into your mind. And you may not even be aware of this stuff, but because conformity is passive, all of this input is going in, and even though you're not maybe aware of it, it's having lingering effects. And people often fall into the trap of underestimating how powerful the world is and overestimating how resilient we think we are. What happens when we've all had a long day at work? Boss get our nerves, the train was late, co-workers on the nerves, the refund check isn't coming, we're angry, right? We're frustrated. We come into our living room, we sit down on the, on the big lazy boy, <sighs> we let go. We're no longer thinking. We disengage. What we do now, we put on the TV. And that's kind of the point, right? We shut off. Because we no longer want to work. We no longer want to be active. Our brains literally go from level 10 to level 0. We shut off because that's what we want to do. And now what happens when we see things, when we hear things? We have all these inputs now going into our mind, which our mind cannot excrete out. Do not be conformed to this world. Now come on, Pastor. You're being a little bit overzealous about this. You're being a little bit too serious. I mean, let's be honest. There's no invisible hand molding my brain, and I can watch TV and watch commercials. It's no big deal. I mean, come on. This is, this is child stuff. Okay. So let me ask you this then. Why is it in the movies that, that are presented in, uh, in Hollywood right now that are popular. Why is it that the good guy is often the guy who kills the most number of people? Why is it that thieves and adulterers and liars are often portrayed as the good guys? They're often portrayed as the heroes of the story. And even though they did something bad, by the end of the movie we're cheering them saying, bravo, bravo thief, you did a, you did a fantastic job. Why is that? 
Do not be conformed to this world. I googled something this week. First time I googled in about a year. And I googled top TV shows of 2017. These are some results. There's a TV show called Pretty Little Liars. So they're liars, but they're pretty and they're little. So we shouldn't really worry about them too much. Do not be conformed to this world. Here's a description of one popular TV show. The, the devil lives amongst us and he's mischievous, but not all that evil. Do not be conformed to this world. Here's the description of the top movie of 2017. A man has a spell cast on him by an enchantress and turns into a beast. A young girl stumbles upon the beast's castle and is then taken prisoner by the beast who abducted the girl's father. The beast then orders his servants to execute mind games so the girl will fall for him. Hmm. Do not be conformed to this world. Because if you allow yourself to be conformed, your mind will follow, then your conscience, and then your morality. And as Charles Spurgeon once wrote, it's the small thorns that cut the tendons of your spiritual muscles so you crawl instead of running. Calories make you fat, whether it tastes good or not. So I am not a legalist. I am not saying thou shall or thou shall not. All I'm asking you to do is when it comes to the things that you feed your mind, now that you know your mind does not have an excretory function, ask yourself, is it true? Is it honorable? Is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely, of good repute, excellent, and worthy of praise? The next thing Paul writes, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So step number three, step numbers one to three dealt with moving away from conformity. Now we're going to get into transformation. So step number four is renew your mind. This is the means of transformation. Transformed comes from a Greek root from which another English word is derived, metamorphosis. It means becoming something that we are not. It's a deep change that begins on the inside and then step by step, it then starts from the inside and then manifests outward like a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Transformation doesn't mean the invisible hand of the world reaching in but it's God working in and through us from the inside, so we now have change that manifests outward. So we are transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds, because sanctification is mind renewal. We are transformed to what? We are transformed to the image of Jesus Christ, because now when God works in us and through us, he can take his divine hand now and do what? Conform us to the image of Jesus, as it says in Romans chapter 8. When we are transformed to the image of Christ, we overcome the world's influence on the self. We no longer seek the world's approval, and we seek after God and eternal things, not ourselves and earthly things. And we are transformed by what? by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and on us. This is cooperative. So when I say we are transformed by the Holy Spirit, I want you to imagine there's a car, and the Holy Spirit has the keys and ignition ready to turn it on. How we now cooperate is we're the ones who put the fuel in the engine, and that fuel is the Word of God. It's Bible reading, it's meditation on the Word of God, and it's hearing the preached Word of God. If you try to put chocolate milk or Kool-Aid into that engine, it is not going to work because the engine of the Holy Spirit. So we are transformed with what? We are transformed with the study of the Word of God, the Bible, the preaching of the Word of God, and meditation on the Word. So now when we take the appropriate fuel 
and put it into that engine. Now the Holy Spirit flicks the switch and that engine runs. And now you and the Holy Spirit walk down the path of your Christian life. Now because we are transformed with the Word of God, we are also transformed with participation in the sacraments, baptism and communion. This highlights the urgent need of why, when you are engaging in mind renewal, you need a local church. You need a gospel-preaching, Bible-teaching, local church. Because mind renewal is not one person being an island. It is you with an open Bible in the context of a Christ-worshipping church. Because literally, as there is a certain spirit of the age on the outside, when you step into the house of God, have fellowship with other people of God, now there's a different age. Now there's a different world. So now all of your sensory inputs in the church are things that are focused on Jesus Christ. And a new mind gives you a new heart, and a new heart is what drives the engine of your life. Step number five is decide on a consistent daily prayer pattern. Step number five is decide on a consistent daily prayer pattern. Faith in Christ animates prayer, and a healthy prayer life imparts the gift of a well-regulated mind and renews that mind. So when you decide on a consistent prayer pattern, it means you decide when you set a time. It decide, you decide where you set a place. And you decide with who. Because particularly when it relates to the Christian families, husbands and wives, fathers and daughters, mothers and sons, there's never meant to be prayer segregation, separate but equal. It's meant to be a communal family enterprise. So yes, you will have your individual prayer time, but you also must come together as a unit and decide who. And by deciding these things in advance, there will be no on-the-fly thinking or second-guessing when the day comes and it's time for you to engage in prayer. Seven steps to renewing your mind. Step number six. Know what God's will is is. Step number six, know what God's will is. Our lives can prove what the will of God is, but only by doing those things that are good and acceptable and pure to him. God's will is our sanctification, and God's will is that we be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And we have to be transformed. You know why? Because if left to our own devices, our minds would want to do all those things that are not the will of God. That's why we have to be transformed. Because there's no other way we can have the ability and be enabled to do what God's will is. So we therefore need mind renewal to execute and to perform the will of God. Because in order to do, we must first think. Because as a man thinks within himself, so he is. Now when we talk about God's will, there's a very simple way to distinguish what God's will is. There's God's secret will, and there's God's revealed will. God's secret will is God's secret. It's His. It's something that exists in the mind of God only. And if a human being, many people when they want to discern God's will, they want to know what His secret will is. But that's a secret thing that belongs to God alone. And if a human being ever did get one atom or one molecule of what the omniscient divine will was, literally speaking, their head would explode because they are finite 
creations. We are never designed or intended to know what God's secret will is. So when we're learning God's will, that never means flying over his revealed will, trying to gain access to what's a secret. As R.C. Sproul says, that's an invasion of God's privacy. Knowing God's will means knowing his revealed will. And his revealed will is revealed in the pages of Scripture. And if anyone passes over the revealed will of God, they are deluded by a false imagination. So knowing the will of God is never an insight into a secret will. It's learning his revealed will in the Bible. So here's a great question. How can you know God's will for your life? This verse talks about knowing God's will. So how can you know God's will for your life? It's actually very simple. A is you read about it. B is you pray about it. And C is you talk about it. A, you read about it. What does that mean? You read about God's revealed will in the Bible. God says, thou shall not commit adultery. That means it's God's will that husbands don't cheat on wives. In the Bible, it says that it's God's will that no one, come, uh, that no one perishes and that everyone come to repentance. That means it's God's will that everyone comes to assenting faith in Jesus Christ. Simple. So you read about it. That also includes meditating on what the Word of God says. The next step is you pray about it. You ask God. You can ask questions. You make supplications based upon what you read about in the Bible, the Word of God. Step C is you now talk about it. You don't talk to your friend. You don't talk to the guy in your corner who fixes cars. You talk to that elder, that pastor, that man well learned in what? The Word of God who can now offer you insights and wisdom based on the revealed will of God in the Bible. And if you do A, B, and C, and you still are unsure, you simply repeat. Because at the end of the day, when it comes to you choosing your next job, deciding what your next church should be, or who you are going to marry, the revealed will of God will never give you a specific answer. What it will tell you is that wherever your next job is, how you should act in the workplace. It will tell you what to look for in a potential mate. And it will tell you what a Bible-centered church is supposed to do. And in case anyone was confused, no matter what choices we make in life, that will never ever catch a sovereign God by surprise. Step number seven, the final step. Seven steps to renewing your mind. Step number seven. Know what God requires. And what does God require? That you present yourself as a living sacrifice. Paul mentions living sacrifice in Romans 12.1, and then he tells us how in Romans 12.2. I explained what it says in Romans 12.2. Now I'm going to go back to Romans 12.1 and tell you what the point of all this is, where all this leads to, what is the end result of being transformed by the renewing of your minds, and that is that you present yourself as a living sacrifice. So Romans 12.1 says, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In other words, having a God-regenerated spirit lets you have a God-renewed mind, and you therefore present your bodies as a sacrifice to God. And this request... Paul says, therefore, I beseech you, he urges and implores the church at Rome to present themselves as a living sacrifice because this is a perfectly logical, 
perfectly rational, perfectly sound request. Because when you realize, as Paul writes, that everything God has done in Romans 1 through Romans 11, that God gave you life when he didn't have to, when he extended his, when he extended his down, hand down low to feed us and bring us in close with bonds of love, when he humbled himself and was spat upon and rejected and, and tortured and crucified and emptied himself, so that we would have life. When you realize that God needing nothing, he didn't have to, but he did. And the reason why any human being has life is because of God. The intellectually informed, reasonable, rational, logical thing that we can now do is to take that thing that God has given to us and say, God, I am yours, my life is yours, here it is. And I, and I present myself, I present my body as a living sacrifice. Because that is so reasonable, that is so logical, that is so rational. If it's reasonable to give your life to Christ, then it's not reasonable to give your life to the world. Because people whose lives matter to God don't matter to them. And let's make sure we're clear about something. When Paul writes, present your bodies a living sacrifice, he's not calling for us to die. He's calling for us to live. Death would actually be easy because that's an event. That's a one-time thing. But when we present ourselves as a living sacrifice, this is now a conscious choice which involves perpetual, ongoing dedication to God and to God alone. And presenting the self as a living sacrifice tells us that being spiritual, being pious, is not about outward conformity. It's about deep inward change, deep inward mind overhaul that can now animate someone to make the informed, conscious, voluntary choice to present themselves as a living sacrifice. Beloved, a living sacrifice, it's never about you giving your time. It's never about you giving your money. It's never about you giving all those things that you're about to lose. It's about giving you. When you present yourself as a living sacrifice, you're not going to leave your resources or your mind somewhere else. You're going to bring yourself because you know you have been engraved in the palm of God's hand. And you now give rightfully back what is God's. This is why laws and rules don't work. It's about inward change. So when you are now transformed, all the plumbing on the inside gets clean. So now everything that flows out of you is pure, is clean, is refreshing, is, refreshing, is life-giving. So the proper response of our lives is worship. The offering of our lives as praise service and reverence of the God who has redeemed us. And as John MacArthur writes, quote, a transformed mind produces a transformed will by which we become eager and able with the Spirit's help to lay aside our own plans and to trustingly accept, accept God's no matter what the cost. This continued yielding involves the strong desire to know God better and to comprehend and follow his purpose for our lives, end quote. So I began speaking about sanctification. I'm going to close speaking about sanctification. Because sanctification now ultimately means surrendering ourselves to God, perfectly exemplified by Jesus Christ, who presented himself as a living sacrifice on the cross 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, and he yielded mind, body, and spirit, not so that his will would be done, but so the Father's will would be done. And he relinquished himself of his position of honor and glory as God in heaven to accept a lowly one here on earth, not for his sakes, 
but for the sake of all of his children. So sanctification means when you stop calling your life my life. And it means you, stop ref you start referring to your life as the life that God gave me. That you now use to live, breathe, and act for him. A sanctified Christian life means you live by the mantra, to God be the glory forever. And that is the single desire of the Christian mind that animates the sanctified Christian life. And we meditate on the fact that we are in Christ, from Christ, because of Christ, through Christ, to Christ, and for Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you once again for the opportunity to magnify, to reflect on, to hear your word, and to meditate and digest it. Lord, we know there are a lot of heavy themes today, and we just ask you, Holy Spirit, to transform our minds by your renewal. Equip us and give us your divine power to not be conformed to the things of this world and to pursue heavenly and eternal things, not earthly things. We know, Almighty God, that oftentimes the reign of a godless society can often quench the fire in our hearts that we have for you and your word. So drive us, shape us, and mold us, O oh Lord, to allow us to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, that all of our thoughts, all of our behaviors, all of our deeds, all of our actions, that we yield to you, Almighty God, and everything that we do to be for your glory and your honor. Lord, we love you. Lord, we adore you and we praise you. And truly and surely, your name will be glorified from everlasting to everlasting. Amen.